Hey y'all, I just want to tell you up front, I just finished editing this video and it is long. This is not a project video. I'm trying to answer some questions about the business of blacksmithing and uh, ways that I make money blacksmithing. So if you're not into that, it's not going to hurt my feelings because uh, this is a long video and it's all me just flapping my gums. I just, just be forewarned. I, I don't want anybody to get in here under false pretenses and be like, well, this is terrible. So you have been warned. Proceed, Brandon. Hey y'all, it's Brandon with Voodoo Forge and I am going to attempt to ask, ask. Hey y'all, it's Brandon with Voodoo Forge and I am going to attempt to answer a question that I get emailed or messaged or or anyway I get asked at least once a month and they're all a little different but the basic variations of this are how do I get better at blacksmithing how do I become a blacksmith to how do I start a business blacksmithing uh, I want to do what you do you know teach me how to do that and yeah let's have a chat about it I'll start with the easiest part of the question how do I get better at blacksmithing well you do it um, but but that's that's the uh, the the short answer the the to get better at blacksmithing you can go a long way by uh, on, on your own building a forge and, and uh, watching some videos and using books you can learn a lot that way but if you really want to get better at blacksmithing you have to be physically around other blacksmiths that is the best fastest way to get better at it because you will see techniques that you have not tried you know they can they can show you the way they do things you can incorporate this with the way you do things and you learn different techniques and processes and and you incorporate all of that into your arsenal of skills which will make you a better blacksmith so there are tons of organizations um, well in the in the United States I know there's in the UK and, and Europe uh, South Africa Australia and there's uh, some in uh, other countries you know these are ones that I I know about for sure but you you need to find a blacksmithing association a club something like that join it and you know if you can take some classes that is the best way to get better at being a blacksmith is you know, learn from other blacksmiths now the the other part of this question is how to how to start a business as a blacksmith how to become a professional blacksmith um, and that that has a that's that's such a multi faceted question um, this is gonna be tough let's see how to how to put this uh, 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 what I did was this this started as a hobby and I, I started with um, a solid fuel forge that I built I was using charcoal and uh, not lump charcoal like you, you you know use on the grill I was making charcoal and using that and then I I uh, got access to coal, started using coal, and uh, I had a piece of railroad track. I did not have proper tongs. I did not have, you know, a, a post vice, you know, but that's how I started, just for fun, something to do, you know, in the evenings, kind of blow off some stress. And from there, I, I found a blacksmith association local to me and joined it and took some classes down there. And, and my skills started to get better. And as I was, was going, I, I started having surpluses of the things I was making. You know, you can only give so much stuff away before, you know, your family's like, oh, <laughs> another hook. So, 
at that point, I started doing small shows, you know, just on the weekends. I had a job. And that was, you know, a, a little side hustle, you know. And your, your profit margin doesn't have to be as much when you're, it's not what you do for a living. So, you know, I could go to a, a, a show on a weekend and, and make, you know, a few hundred bucks. And I was like, ooh, yeah, really, really getting this going. And then, you know, some custom jobs started to come in. And after a few years of doing that, I, I started to think about doing this full time because I really enjoyed it. And I talked to my wife and we discussed it and we started easing into it. I, I didn't quit my day job, um, but I started blacksmithing more and with more purpose uh, with the idea of doing shows more. Uh, I also started the blacksmith uh, association that I was in. There were a few people who I would call professional blacksmiths who, who did it for a living. And it, but it wasn't just blacksmithing. Blacksmithing was usually an aspect of what they did. Like there were a couple of guys that were farriers and in their downtime, you know, they just forged things. There were uh, a couple of guys who specialized in, in railings and fabrication, but you know, they could do custom work on those railings to suit their customers' needs. There was one guy, um, who, who was, he, he was really an artist blacksmith, and he became my mentor, Dan Goostery. And he's, he's passed now. But I called him up, and I was like, hey, Dano, uh, you know, I'm interested in doing, you know, what you do. <laughs> and he said, I don't know what it is you think I do, but you probably don't. And it was really discouraging, phone call. Anyway, a few months later, I was presented with a, a, a job, an opportunity to do a job that was a gate that was, it was beyond my capabilities and it was beyond the tools that I had at the time. So I contacted Dano and got him the information and he bid the job and got the job. And after that, he called me and invited me to come up to his shop one night. And we uh, really that night, we just had a few beers, uh, I used a power hammer for the first time, and uh, his shop was, was absolutely amazing. The space was amazing. The tools he had was amazing. And he, you know, after we talked, he decided that, yes, I really wanted to do this. So I started working for him on an as-needed basis uh, in the evenings and on weekends and things like that for, for an hourly rate. And I really learned a lot not just in techniques, but about the business of blacksmithing. And that's, that's where I got my start. And uh, before he passed away, I wasn't working for him. We were doing jobs together in a, in a, a partnership. And it was, it, it was great. I learned so much from Dano. Uh, I really wish I had his eye for things, you know, he could, he could put a flow on things that I, I don't, I don't have that. Um, but one of the things that he told me, you know, because he was an artist blacksmith, is he said, "Do you know what the definition of an artist is?" So I was like, "No, nah, yeah, I don't know." I came up with something. He was like, "Nope, it's somebody whose spouse has a job," and there is some truth to that. Before before you decide to to quit your job and invest all your money in, in tools and equipment. Here are the things you need to know about being a professional blacksmith. It is like any sole proprietorship business. You are responsible for all the things that you're not responsible for as an employee of somebody else. Um, insurance, you know, um, Taxes, um, business licenses, all of that stuff. You know, it, it's a business. So you have to get that taken care of. 
because if you don't get it taken care of, I will tell you, you're, you're a blacksmith, you're, you're starting this, let's say you're starting this business at your, your home. You're gonna irritate somebody if you have neighbors remotely nearby. You're gonna irritate somebody. And if you don't have all your ducks in a row, you're gonna get in trouble. And you're gonna, it's, it, it, it can not be good. It hasn't happened to me, but it has happened to friends of mine who did not have all their ducks in a row. You're somewhere selling at a show and the tax guy comes around and you're not paying your state sales tax, you're gonna get in trouble. You know, you don't have the right insurance. First of all, there's a lot of jobs that you you can't even bid unless you can show you have insurance. So that's that's part of it. And that wasn't something that I knew about before I started, but I learned that stuff quickly. So <laughs> another one of the, the negative aspects of this is this is physically difficult. Now you may, you may uh, enjoy blacksmithing, you know, a, an hour or two in the evening or, you know, maybe six, seven hours on the weekend or, or maybe even a full eight, nine hour day on the weekend. But take that eight or nine hour day and make it six days a week, seven days a week, and sometimes make it a 12 hour day because that's the reality of starting your own business and building it. You're gonna have to put in days like that. And it is, it is physically draining. Now I'm clearly not some sort of uh, Olympic athlete, but you know, being on my feet, swinging a hammer, working in the heat, um, that's, that, those are things that I have, I, I can do. You know, you need to make sure that you can physically do the work. And when you are working mostly by yourself and you go down, you injure yourself because you're not, you're not resting properly, you're not taking care of yourself. You know, if you're, if you, if you're back, uh, you pinch a, a nerve or something in your back or, uh, you know, you, you, you hurt your elbow, it, it all grinds to a halt. So you, you have to, to think about those things and have all those things covered. You know, is this really, is this really how you want to spend your life? You know, sometimes I, I worry that uh, the the main the main goal in blacksmithing is to just work until the point when you can't work anymore, and then you sell your tools to take care of the assisted living facility that you're going to be living in until that money runs out and they you know, throw you out or do whatever they do with you. Tools are a big deal. You want a you want a business. You uh, you can blacksmith. You can forge with just you know a a forge something to use for an anvil, a hammer, some tongs, and a, a vice uh, would be pretty handy. Just just little projects. You can do that. You know, hobby blacksmith, blacksmith enthusiasm enthusiast. You know that's your passion. You need a limited amount of tools to forge, but to make a living. You, you need you need tools you need some pretty big tools um, I don't have all the tools that I need right now I'm sitting here needing a bigger power hammer and that's you know on the way um, just well just looking around the shop uh, band saws uh, switch blocks vices you know welders you know uh, woodworking tools grinders power hammers, drill press, you know, these, these are all things that that you need. And a lot of people will dismiss some of these things. Like, oh no, I, you know, I made the, the hook at this class and I can, I can do this. Yeah, you, you can, but it's not going to be profitable. You need as many tools, make as many jigs, do as much as you can to make making your product as easy and simple as you can. Revenue streams. You, you need to have several revenue streams, especially in the beginning when you're first starting out. And I don't know if I can tell you the right way to do that. I can tell you what I did is the first thing I did was I had already been doing shows 
and I, I upped that. I started doing more shows. But let me tell you, doing shows is a grind. If you want to, you can be at a different show almost every weekend. And that, that'll kill you because you've only got a few days to make your product. You're, you're pretty much a ghost to your family. So I don't recommend you do shows every weekend, but you, you do shows and you do good shows. You have to figure out which shows work for you. You have to have your show set up, you know, your, your tent, your, um, your tables, your tablecloths, uh, all of that, you know, your, your tr how you haul your stuff, your trailer, all of that. You need to have all of that figured out. The reality of doing shows as this is how you make your living and doing shows as a side hustle is completely different. <clears throat> if this is your hobby, this is your little, little side business, <clears throat> you don't have to make as much money because you have a job that's paying the bills, or I'm assuming you do. But if it's just your little side business, it, it's, you don't have to make as much money. If I do a show, let's say I do a show and I have spent a month making the products that I'm going to sell at that show. When I go to that show, let's say booth rent is, is $500. It's 200 miles away from my shop. So it, it's a three day show. So I'm going to be gone four to five days because you got to get down there. You got to get set up. You do the show, then you got to tear down, come back. So you've got to think about wear and tear on your vehicle, you've got to think about fuel, you've got to think about food, you've got to think about your, your accommodations. You know, are you going to be staying in a hotel? Are you going to be camping? Are you going to be sleeping in the truck? You know, you've got to get all that figured out. So let's say total cost on the show, everything included is, is going to be $1,200. If it's $1,200 and I make $3,000, that means the time that I spent producing that product, that month, that, that uh, you know, four, four work week period, I made $1,800. That's not good. That's not good at all. So... You know, a show like that, I would have to make seven or eight thousand dollars at that show for it to be worth it, because you've got to pay yourself for making the product. You cannot, you cannot only cover the cost of the material and the consumables. You know, if if you're paying for the steel and and your your fuel for your forge and the show and making a couple hundred bucks, you're you're losing money because you're you're giving your labor away for free. You've got to pay yourself. It's a business and you've got to pay yourself. You've got to make money. And that is one revenue stream is doing shows, but shows are a lot harder when it's your, your profession, when it's your main income. Uh, selling online is something that I have looked into and a lot of people do it, and I understand a lot of people have uh, good results with it. It's not really for me because the amount of competition online. Um, if, if you're, uh, the, the difference between online and physically having your products in front of somebody is the, the impulse. You know, people can touch it and feel it and they want it and they buy it. So that's that's but that is a, a thing that a lot of people do and a lot of people do well with so you might want to look at that as a, a revenue source um, oh also when you're doing shows the stuff you take take more than you could possibly sell take thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars worth of inventory you know and you will slowly learn this because you you hopefully have learned this doing this as a side hustle you figure out what you make that people want and when you you come up with something new or new to you and you start making that you know you make a few of them and you see how they sell and then you you learn you learn that there's some items you have to have just a bunch of to sell like seriously hooks you've got to have 
piles and piles of hooks that are you know close to the same I'm not gonna say identical but but close to the same because people want to buy several of them you know they don't just want one so keep that in mind when you're planning for shows but um, moving on from that custom work <clears throat> Custom work falls into a couple of different categories, for me, anyway. I have some customers who are repeat customers, and we have built relationships over years. And they are mostly makers or craftspeople um, on their own. And what we do with each other is... I make something that they then add to. What I make for them is an element in in what they produce. You know, they're not the end user of my product. And these customers are, uh, I'll give you a couple of examples. Like, uh, I've got a guy who does custom high-end cabinet work. I make a lot of cabinet pulls and drawer pulls and things like that for him. He's not the end user. You know, they get sold to his customer. And uh, there are times when, you know, he'll, he'll call me and I'll have to make a sample set of something that he's going to present to his customer and they decide what they're going to do. And he understands that he has to pay for that sample set. You know, it's not, it's not just a freebie, but that's, you know, that's part of his business and we work together. Um, I've got a, a couple of guys that make custom tables and uh, sometimes they need a, a forged or fabricated table base and I, I do those for them but these 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 relationships take a long time to build and it always starts small so when you encounter somebody who is also a craftsperson and they are talking to you about a job always make sure that you do a good job for them because you want to build that relationship and it could turn into uh, a steady income, you know. I mean, I, 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 a couple of orders from those kind of people uh, a month will will really help your pocketbook out. So that's that's one aspect of custom work. Another aspect of custom work is somebody who you have given your card to at some point in time, or they found you online, and they want a one-off thing made for them this this could be you know any anything it, it could be anything from you know hand forged nails to uh, a, a gate um, but they're not it's not that they don't appreciate the quality of, of your work but it's just they they don't they're not repeat customers they're not they're not gonna be back you might you might talk to them again in a couple of years but you still you know you have to really take care of those people because you have have made something and if you make something that they're proud of when people you know when people come to their house and they they or their business and they see this and they're like man this is cool where'd you get this oh man, this guy made this for me and it can lead to more business that way but usually they are a once-off thing and these jobs you know well once again two or three a month you know, they're, they're something that, that comes up. Uh, except when the, when the COVID lockdown happened. People who have been sitting on my card for years decided they were going to go ahead with their project thing. And uh, so a lot of, a lot of one-off work during that time period. Thank God. But um, that was, a, that was a, a good, good thing about that. But that's, that's custom work. And uh, then you've got production forge work and this is stuff you make for resellers of of your product and these relationships also take years to cultivate uh, and th this could be anything from catalog companies to stores boutiques um, you know just any kind of reseller you know, there are people who, who do shows every every weekend. They've got a different big show they're going to. They'll be in Texas and then Florida, and then they'll go up to uh, Maine, and 
they don't make anything, they resell stuff. And I sell to a lot of them, I sell to stores, and it's, it's production work though. You know, they will order 50 of this kind of hook, uh, 50 of this size triangle, and they're wholesaling. So they get, you know, a wholesale price. Now, that was something that it took me a long time to wrap my head around, was, was you know, well, it, it doesn't take me any less to make this and you know if I sold this I'd be selling it for $15 but I'm selling it to them for $10 but the fact of the matter is is if I'm selling it to them for $10 first of all they're buying 20 of them and I don't have to fool with trying to sell it you know that's that's out the door it's $200 made right there and uh, the the trouble with the production work is it is productive foraging is just like any other kind of production work. It is soul crushing. You know, so you want to figure out a way that you can do this the most efficient and a way where you will not go insane. But you will get days when you've had to make the same thing all day long. <clears throat> and sometimes days on end, you know, on an order. <clears throat> you know, you've, you've got to make the same thing all day long but that is meat and potatoes of, of, of your business sometimes you know and um, with with my production customers I try to anticipate their orders they understand that when they order something it's not gonna be delivered immediately you know I discuss with them how long it's gonna take but some of them I know about when they start to run out of stuff and when they're gonna order so I'll try to do you know, a few this day and a few this day, so I can have that inventory built up. And that is that is a, a good revenue stream for, for me, anyway. Uh, another thing is, you, I, I don't make knives. A lot of guys want to get into the knife making, and I, I have seen a lot of guys who make some really good knives, just, just broken hearted, because this knife that they've got, you know, 40 hours in, sells for 200 bucks. They're not making money. I don't fool with knives. I don't like making knives. I can make knives. I don't like doing it. It just, it is a, it is not the best use of my time. Um, but um, learn, learn how to weld because you will get uh, fabrication jobs mixed in there <clears throat> and it that that is a good revenue stream um also you know i live in a rural area in the summertime especially during hay cutting season it is not unusual for me to hear a tractor clattering up the driveway and somebody's got something they need welded right then you know and it's one of my neighbors and that you know you can make some money on that don't be don't beat those guys up too much. Their their profit margin is pretty thin anyway. But uh, you know, so so learn some different welding processes, and uh, you don't you don't have to be a, a pipeline welder, you know, to to do these things. But you know, learn how to learn how to do it. Now, when you're dealing with the one-off custom orders, don't be scared about pricing your projects where you need it to be to make a profit you have to make a profit otherwise uh, you're not in this correctly so uh, when somebody shows up with their their picture off of uh, Pinterest or I think that's what it's called when they show up with those pictures off of that and they want you to make something um, price it where you're gonna make money on it and if, if, if they're, you know, oh, that's too expensive, you know, don't adjust your price because they undervalue your work. You, you cannot lose money to make customers happy. If you give them a, a fair price and they think that it's outrageous, those people are not your customers. They need to get their, their cast Chinese crap you know, they're not, they don't deserve hand-forged items. 
because they do not appreciate the work that goes into it. So do not underprice your work just to get a job. You know, those people are not your customers until they have agreed to pay you for your work. Then they're your customer. Then you do everything you can to take care of them. But don't drop your price below the value of your product. It is worth it to hire in help when you need help. Now getting reliable help, I know no secret to that. Uh, mostly when I need help, I've got a couple of buddies who are enthusiast blacksmiths and they like to come hang out at the shop because they think it's cool because they're not in here all the time. <laughs> but I'll get them and pay them and we'll do that. And then we also get to, you know, drink beer and solve world problems and stuff when we're done. But get help when you need it. And if you get to the point to where you need full-time help, get full-time help and take care of them. You know, always take care of your employees because if you don't, they will not take care of you. I hope this is helpful and I'm not trying to be discouraging, but this is, this is not, this is not uh, a romanticized business. Some of what I said may sound like I'm trying to discourage you, but if you really want to do this, you know, give it a shot. It is up to you, you know, uh, but it's not one of those things where it's just, it's not easy. It is a task to do this for a living. You have to always be, you have to always be hustling. You cannot, um, you can't stop. You know, always be trying to figure out something new, always be moving towards the next thing. I think that's it. I don't know if I, I don't know if I really answered that. I tried to, I didn't really know how to answer it, but I get asked that with such frequency that I, I felt like I should just do a video on it. And that way, every time somebody asks me that question, I will just refer them to that video um, but that's yeah that's that's my take on it that's what I have done that is what I do so I hope you get something from this and uh, y'all behave yourselves um, you know like subscribe all that oh YouTube I make a little bit just, just a little bit of money off YouTube not much you know um, so you know that that's a that's a thing. I'm not I'm not saying that uh, you know that that would work for everybody. It doesn't really work for me. But you can help me out if you watch the damn commercials. Look, I don't like watching YouTube commercials either. But it would help me out if you did. So if you do watch the commercials before and during and after my videos, you, my friend, are a legend, and I love you in a manly way, like a man loves you know football. <laughs>